You're listening to The Doctor Is In Podcast. This is the show where you get the best tips, tricks, and nutritional hacks to help you and your family get healthier. You'll also hear what works and what doesn't work so you don't have to waste your time and money. All right, let's get started. Hello, I'm Dr. Martin Jr. And I'm Dr. Martin Sr. And this is the Doctors In Podcast, and this is episode 113. And since we're filming this episode in December of 2017, and, you know, obviously we get a lot of questions about this every day, every week, about eating throughout the holidays. So we'll spend a fair amount of time on, you know, some tips and some tricks that you can use to eat through the holidays so that you don't completely derail uh, your health or your goals uh, as you go into this busy holiday season. Yeah, because we want you to enjoy it and not to, you know, not to feel guilty. We always say in the office that we, we give you a recipe for success, not for failure. You know, we understand people have holidays, people go on a cruise or people go yeah, and, an all-inclusive and they're, they're, you know, they want to eat. And we're going to give you some tips today on how to get through and not, and not to shipwreck yeah, obviously, your, your uh, one of the disclaimers that we always bring up when we talk about these things is that the whole point of prevention or eating better most of the time is so that you can do these types of things yeah. and not derail your health. However, if you're a diabetic or you're really insulin resistant, your body has no idea that it's a holiday. It's not going to just say, "Ah, go ahead, I'll give you this one here." I won't, you know, I won't go into give any- you a mulligan. Yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. So, uh, you know, we always, you know, we would rather people choose to eat a certain way rather than be forced to eat a certain way. And so if you're one of the uh, ones who are still able to choose, then these tips are fantastic. Again, if you're diabetic or really bad insulin resistant or you got a disease of some kind, then, you know, we would definitely recommend not uh, not, uh, giving into the season as difficult as that can be. Yeah. You know, you always like to say, you know, we got some Italian blood in us, so we fully understand baking and cooking and all those kind of things. So we're going to talk about some holiday tips, but before we do that, I just want to uh, talk quickly because you and I were talking off air about uh, a study that we saw recently, and it had to do with proton pump inhibitors. Now, a proton pump inhibitor, uh, just in case you're not aware, is something basically that is used for, uh, I guess, heartburn would be the yeah, simplest way. Reflux. Yeah, so the idea is that they, in order to control the hydrochloric acid in your stomach, this medication, this proton pump inhibitor, will actually turn off the mechanism by which you make acid. So you're not making hydrochloric acid, which is good because you're going to get rid of heartburn, but it's bad because there's a definite reason why you need that hydrochloric acid. So anyways... One of the things that we have highlighted in our newsletters and we've talked about over different podcasts is these things are not without consequences. You know, you watch sports. I watch sports. Uh, I'm a big Habs fan. You're a big Habs fan. You're a big Steelers fan. I'm a big Bears fan, unfortunately. And one of the commercials that you see all the time when watching sports are uh, heartburn medication, proton pump and hips and nexiums and They love advertising because, you know, we're the audience that would overeat. and Purple pill. Yeah, and so the whole idea is, you know, eat what you want and take this purple pill beforehand and you don't suffer the consequences. And, of course, the only consequence you're not going to suffer is heartburn. It's not going to stop all the other consequences, but you're just not going to get. And, you know, I've said this before is that heartburn is basically your body is yelling at you. It's screaming. It's trying to get your attention. It can't get it another way. So it's getting it by just screaming at you. Heartburn, just think of heartburn as your body is screaming at you. The alarm's going off. So we came across a study, uh, you know, well, first, I guess, some previous studies, right? We already know that long-term use of antacids or proton pump inhibitors. I guess we can explain the difference between an antacid and a proton pump inhibitor because somebody asked us about that recently. An antacid is basically something you take that would basically suppress, suppress, calm, coat, soothe. So the acid is there and you just pop a couple of antacids and it's you know, usually calcium based and yeah. And know. it just kind of like acts as a buffer and it kind of just yeah. quenches that roll aids and tums. So those are antacids. And then as we mentioned, proton pump inhibitors actually 
are a little different, they actually turn off the mechanism. Again, you need hydrochloric acid. And one of the things that we know is that it's actually not a lack of acid that's causing the problem. But before we get into that, let's just quickly talk about this other study. So we know already long-term use of antacids or proton pump inhibitors are really hard on the bones. I mean, it makes sense. A lot of the nutrients that your bones need to stay healthy come from the food that you eat. And if you're not breaking down that food properly, the bones pay a price. And you need a furnace, right? You need that acid to be in the place that the only place you need to be acidic in the body is in that stomach, right? In the first part of the colon. And everything else you want to be alkaline. That acidity is there for, it's a furnace. It's just going to melt your food down into micro-size it so that your body can readily absorb it. You look at a lot of autoimmune issues, for example, a lot of the factors in leaky gut, and you know we always see leaky gut with autoimmune, but one of the big factors is this. They're, they don't break their food down properly, right? They, the food comes in, I, I'm being simplistic, but almost like too big. It hasn't been broken down enough. Yeah, and that and now stresses it an antigen, right? out the di- You know, think of what that does to the bowels. But yeah, you're right. I mean, that's a uh, again, you'd absolutely need that hydrochloric acid. So when you're not even making it in the first place, or you're suppressing it or quenching it, uh, that causes some big problems. So we know that there. It's we already know that it's hard on the bones. We know that there can be very hard on the brain as well for the very same reasons. Right, leads to gut inflammation or. Uh, lack of nutrients, the brain needs that stuff. So, I mean, there's so many little effects that we already know uh, about them. But, however, another study that we found interesting is that they found that proton pump inhibitors actually uh, increases the risk for kidney diseases. And this was the result from, it's actually a fairly big study. They uh, they looked at 290,000 patients and they found that the proton pump inhibitors. So, again, the thing that kind of irritates me about these is a lot of these are over-the-counter right? Like they're just... Well, that's what they did, isn't it, with uh, what they did with Nexium? Yeah, over the counter. So, you know, And there's a kind of a stigma, a right? right? Like if there's a kind of a stigma that, uh, and uh, effectively marketed in the sense that, hey, it's over the counter, it's safe. They wouldn't put something over the counter that can cause issues, so it's got to be pretty safe. And obviously, you don't need a doctor telling you how and when to take it, so it's got to be okay. And so they put a lot of these things over the counter, and you know, as a result, you know, people, heartburn is a big issue for people, right? And if they continue to eat the same foods that they're eating and they're just popping these things and they feel better, so they're not getting that heartburn, it's not waking them up at nighttime. A lot of times, some people cough all the time because of, you know, acid reflux in the throat and it's causing all these issues. And, you know, so people get in this habit of taking it and then next thing you know, they've been taking it for a few years and their bones are getting weaker, brains getting weaker. and. Now we know that it actually increases the risk of some kidney issues, right? So if you're a diabetic, think about that for a second, because one of the bad outcomes of diabetes is kidney. So now combine a diabetic with somebody who's taken Nexium. And a lot of times diabetics are taking antacids and Nexium because the types of foods that they were eating to give them diabetes. Yeah, well, for sure. It's always a classic sign. When we give out the questionnaire as patients come to the office, or it's part of our questionnaire for when they when they do biomarker testing is are you suffering from heartburn or acid reflux, right? And the reason that we we're asking that question is because we want people to realize that acid reflux, again, it's it's the alarm system, but at one of the it it usually means that you're very insulin resistant. Well and that's what I was just gonna ask you. The number one cause of heartburn in the average person is uh, it's really a sign of insulin resistance. Yeah. Too many carbohydrates, uh, crappy, carbs. crappy carbs, right? Ve- and vegetable oils. Yeah, crappy vegetable oils. Uh, we'll do an upcoming podcast on canola oil. Uh, some interesting studies have come out. Uh, short version, stay away from it. Yeah. However, pretty much everybody with heartburn, it goes away once they cut out that crappy processed carbs and add some digestive enzymes uh, to their routine, right? It just, it's amazing, it goes away. Yeah. So, Anyways, we that, that was a study that caught our attention that we wanted to share with you before we get into some holiday tips because some people, well, we get a lot of people asking us about heartburn, so we figured, you know, take a couple minutes. Yeah, listen, if you're if you're taking an over the counter or you're on a medication, we want to get to the source of it. We 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 really yeah, because that's like definitely a band aid, right? That's definitely you're uh, <laughs> you're just covering up the problem. It ain't going away. 
Uh, it's just making it feel better. And as humans, if we're not being reminded and, of it. And another thing is, if you are on an antacid, if you are on a proton pump inhibitor, anything at all, if you're if you're getting acid reflux at all, you have to understand you are going to be deficient in B12. Because if you're taking anything to suppress your Yeah, that's acidity, a great point. Because you need a healthy stomach to get B12. You need that intrinsic factor. Yeah. That's a great point. Yeah. So, which then usually means that, uh, you know, you can kind of go one step from there. Generally, people that are chronically on an antacid or a proton pump inhibitor typically, you know, feel good. They don't got good energy. And that can compound the problem in the brain. It goes on. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, that's mm-hmm. so if, you, if you're on an antacid, you definitely should be taking a sublingual B12, right? I mean, there's no question about yeah. that. So, all right, let's talk about some of these uh, holiday tips that, uh, you know, we recommend to people over the holiday season. Uh, Again, these are tips for people that have that flexibility to do this because these are not the same tips that we would give somebody if they've got diabetes or they're trying to reverse something. So, but again, let's talk about this. Probably the number one, you know, really tip that we uh, suggest over the holiday season, if you are not doing a form of intermittent fasting, the holiday season is the best time to do it. Yeah. Right? So let's... You're going out tonight, could you have a big, big meal or your families? Yeah, it's a feast or famine, right? It's a great concept. Yeah. It is, right? I mean, it's a, you know, it's that real good idea. You're going to feast tonight, so you might as well famine (laughs) leading up to that feast, right? As much as you can. So let's talk about that a little bit first, the idea why fasting can play such a great role in kind of keeping you going uh, throughout the holiday season. So first of all, you know, one of the uh, therapeutic uh, advantages that uh, a form of fasting has is, you know, we always talk a lot about insulin. We talk a lot about... Insulin, never heard of it. (laughs) There are, you know, it's funny because, you know, we can pretty much just push play insulin, just, you know, use insulin for the answer for everything. It's such a key, key. Well, look, it's a food hormone. So if you're going to eat... Well, and that's what my point I was going to bring up was, is that, you know, insulin is a food hormone. And, you know, okay, I I guess there's one thing that we should probably uh, clarify, because I know a lot of times we talk about, you know, how an insulin is spike and all that kind of stuff. And every time you eat, you're going to bring up your insulin. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, we are made... Mm -hmm. God made us with the idea that our insulin is going to go up after a meal. We're not anti-insulin at all. The problem occurs when insulin is chronically elevated. It's not, we are meant to bring up our insulin after we eat. Insulin is a partitioning. It stores things. It moves things. It, so we need it. It's a vital, right? It, it's an important aspect of after we eat. The problem that we people run into is when insulin is chronically elevated, you know, one of the kind of lies, I hate to use the word lies, but one of the myths about nutrition, and, I, you know, I don't even really know where this came from. Well, it started years ago. I know what you're going to say, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, about this concept of eating six times a day, right? And you got to keep that, I remember. Uh, keep the stove going. Yeah, keep that metabolism stoked, right? You got to keep it burning, and so you eat all day. And the problem with that is, you know, that's a recipe for insulin resistance because one of the things needed to create insulin resistance is chronically elevated insulin is one of the factors, right? So if somebody's eating all day, you know, they're kind of grazing all day, their insulin is never taking a break. So that's yeah. a that's a problem. And that's a huge, huge problem if you're trying to lose weight because I always love the graph that is part of our uh, the serial killers and even the metabolic storm. I love that graph when you show <laughs> it, it. It's ingenious because. Um, well, yeah, and the idea being that within, and I, yeah, I mean, it really is an interesting. Uh, it, it really is an interesting graph. But so I guess the point of, you know, when you're eating, insulin's elevated, and if insulin's elevated all the time, then you're going to be taking that energy. You're going to be storing it at muscle, liver and eventually into your fat cells, right? So that's the that's the problem with chronically elevated insulin. So here you have, uh, you know, we in a society today where people think they got to eat all day, and, you know, so then this concept of 
uh, fasting comes along and, you know, people are like, yeah, you can't, you're going to starve yourself. Well, I don't think we have that issue here. <laughs> and you got to give it to the food industry. They did a real good job of te- of getting people's head. Hey, if you want to lose, you know, this was big for a while ago. I don't hear it as much anymore, but if you want to lose weight, you got to eat more food. Yeah. Right. I mean, eat frequently. Yeah, eat frequently, eat more food, six times a day, smaller meals, and, you know, boom, and you're going to lose weight. You know, if you're, uh, you know, you, you, you happen to play for the team that we like, the Montreal Canadiens, and you're, you know, you're six foot one. And, well, and you're expending one, a lot of energy. Yeah, 180, and you're, you're, you're in the gym, and you're working out, you're playing ball, and hockey, and you're working out like you're like a greyhound there you're just lean mean fighting machine well you know what you can eat, you can eat you can eat a lot more frequently in those people yeah whereas the know. average person listening to this podcast and us included really yeah. we sit a lot in a day right and so we don't need that kind of constant plus there's definitely a different physiological reaction that occurs to somebody who's insulin sensitive versus insulin resistant right there's a big difference and there's also different things that happen after you exercise. You become way more insulin sensitive. You can, can you can handle things differently. But the point being this: insulin is a food hormone, and when you fast, you're not eating, so therefore insulin is low. Right? It's a great way to keep insulin levels low. Yeah. So when you fast, that's the one of the ideas. Now, fasting also has you know tremendous anti aging effects. Yeah. So it, good for it the cells. Your growth hormone. Helps your cells kind of clean out yeah. old cells. Yeah. It's just awesome. Because, in, you know, and it, it, it's insulin. It's almost like spraying at the cells. And the cells have to, it creates an inflammatory response in the body. And the idea with it is, like like you're saying, if if you're starting your day, let's say Christmas Day, or you know you're going to have a big party tonight, the, the Christmas parties or whatever, then the idea is if you can keep that insulin down for the vast majority of the day, and then you know you're going to have a big meal tonight. Like you're not going to be able to avoid it, and we're not even telling you to avoid it. So there are basically, when we talk about fasting, there's kind of three categories Mm -hmm. of fasting that we talk about. The first one being kind of this idea of intermittent fasting. So the idea is we talk about uh, an eating window, right? So there's 24 hours in a day, and somebody who uh, you know eats breakfast at 8 in the morning and stops eating at 8 at night, well, that's a 12-hour eating window. So yeah. that means that they're eating for about 12 hours in the day, and then they're fasting for 12 hours in the day at Cause nighttime. Because they're asleep. Because they're sleeping. However, in North America, we tend to eat more hours in a day than we actually rest, uh, which, again, causes a lot of digestive issues, but that's another episode in itself. However, so when we talk about shortening your eating window... You know, imagine what happens now if a person maybe eats their first meal at 11 and stops eating at 6. Well, that's a seven-hour That's a seven hour eating window, which means they're fasting for a lot longer than that, yeah. right? So the idea being, you know, we like to see people fasting for, you know, about 18 hours and eating for about 6 hours or vice versa, right? Eight hours of eating. That's ideal. That's ideal, right? And then so that that's kind of what we like to see. And... When it comes to Christmas, so if you know, for example, let's talk real practical here. So you're going to have a Christmas meal tonight, you know, right? You, you know, like we know tomorrow night, for example, we're going to have a big Christmas meal. So what do you do? So you stop eating tonight, you know, around 6, 30, 7 o'clock at night or, whatever, you know, whatever. And you try to fast for, you know, 16 you know, hours or so. You, you break, you start eating around 12 or, you know, eat lunch. If you can. If you can. Yeah. And, you know, you, you try to eat. Uh, not too much, and then because you know you're going to have a big meal, and that's one way of doing it, right? There's no question. So, and, and if, it works because you're keeping your insulin. Yeah, down. you're keeping your insulin down all night, all most the of the fat, morning. Like remember when that when that the the scene of your fat being kept in your body, because as long as insulin is present in your bloodstream, you're not getting rid of fat. You know that's a great point, right? When insulin is present, you are. You know, there's there's a process in the body where the you know you break down fat cells. So you your you know your fat cells are are just basically stored energy, right? So what happens is, it's always a good thing when you're breaking down your own fat cells for energy. Yeah. However, in the presence, of, whenever insulin is present, that stops completely. 
one can't work with the other. So as soon as you start eating food and insulin is present, your body stops breaking down your own fat cells for energy so you don't use it. And you end up using the energy, the food that you're eating. If you don't need it, you store it. And and rather than burning fat, you're storing fat, right? So one of the important reasons why you keep your insulin low when you're fasting is because basically you're tapping into your own fat cells for energy. So you're in a kind of a mild ketosis in a sense. You're burning fat for energy. So it's a great way. You know, it's an it's an awesome thing. It's good for your brain. It's good for your digestive system. Mm-hmm. There's so many advantages to fasting. And a lot of people will fast the first half of the day. And we're talking holiday specifics here. So a lot of times people are going to eat a big meal at night. So they're going to skip breakfast. They're going to break their fast at lunchtime. So let's talk about when, for the holidays, this is not something that we generally, you know, would recommend always for fasting. But let's talk about during the holidays so you're going to have a big meal tonight. There's a few or tomorrow night. There's a mm-hmm. few things that we recommend when it comes to fasting. First of all, save your carbs because you're going to. I mean, one of the things with Christmas feasting is always carbs, right? So you know you're going to get your carbs at the end of the day. Don't eat them earlier. So when you break your fast, this is what we recommend. We recommend a low fat, and people are like, "What low fat? You guys are high fat people." But they're not. Let us explain ourselves for a second. We recommend pro- protein if you can. Break your fast with protein, as much protein as possible. Hit your protein targets because protein makes you feel full. Yeah. Uh, and it's great. You know, it, it stimulates that muscle th- synthesis. It's important. One of the things that people don't do when they start feasting is they don't hit their protein. They, they fill up on carbs and... The mashed potatoes. Yeah. So, you and know, the bread, right? if you're going to break your fast, you know, try to get as much protein as Have possible. Keep your fat yeah. lowish, right? Yeah. Because uh, you know you you know at nighttime you're gonna eat a lot of carbs, and the worst combination, no question, are carbs and fat. Yeah. You can't you can't have a high carb, high fat diet. That that is the that, you know they literally. If I was conducting an experiment and I wanted to make a rat fat quickly, if I wanted to, so they call it an obesogenic chow or rat chow. So if I wanted to get a rat really fast for the purpose of a study. Basically, it's high carb, high fat, right? Because that's just it. What happens is you get a lot of carbs, so you you get more energy than your body needs, and all that fat just goes right into storage. It, it's a it's a terrible combination. Yeah. So a lot of the Christmas feasts are a combination of fat and carbs, right? And so the and you know that going in. So the last thing you want to do is go into a meal already with eating a lot of fat that day. So the best thing you can do would be, you know, keep your fat low have a lot of protein, drink a lot of water. Drinking a lot of water before eating is a great way not to eat as much when you're going to eat. Yeah. People don't realize that, right? It really does help with a feeling of fullness. And a little trick that we love at the clinic is, you know, if you can, and people don't often think of this, but you all, you should actually have a coffee. Have a coffee with your meal. You can have one after too if you want. Yeah, before, during, or after, yeah. especially before, it, during. It really does help to lower insulin. And, and why is that? Well, you just mentioned it because it's a great way. It makes you a little bit more insulin sensitive, yeah. so you don't need to secrete as much yeah. of that after. You know, someone has said that coffee is much like metformin, that uh, metformin is a drug they give for uh, diabetics, right? That often, you know, literally in Canada, be millions of diabetics on metformin. But coffee acts like metformin because it, it really does help your insulin uh, to work properly, right? So, again, it, it, it just lowers that at the cellular level, lowers your, your resistance to insulin. And if you want to add one more, like, super hack to all this, so we talk about fasting, eat less, break your fast with some protein, keep your carbs really low, keep your fat low, and, if you know, drink some coffee, and then if you can lift weights or do a high intensity interval training before empty out those glycogen, you know, empty out those storage in your liver and your muscles, empty them out as much as possible so that when you do eat those carbs, it just goes back into the muscles, goes back into normal storage rather than excess. That is awesome. Not only will lifting weights before eating or, you know, a high intensity interval training type of routine not only will it empty out your glycogen stores, it will also make you more insulin sensitive after, so you won't even need as much insulin. So the combination of a fast, protein, water, coffee, 
lifting weights or exercise before is probably the a best way to get through your holidays. The best thing that you can do. Yeah. If you can combine all of that, that's awesome, right? If you can't, then definitely fasting is a great one. No question. Yeah, and we like our insulin balance too. That helps. And, you know, for just people asking, I give it to uh, lots of patients that yeah, say, high hey, DHA. Man, take this. Yeah, yeah. High DHA is so that, the good, it's good, healthy fat, right? So, so, anyways, that's, you know, that's yeah. generally what we would recommend to people, uh, you know, as kind of a tip to kind of get through the holiday season to allow them to also enjoy themselves. Uh, you know, again, mm-hmm. we're not anti food, we're definitely not. Uh, anti-food. So we just uh, like to give people the best tips possible to get through. So I hope you found that uh, enjoyable or practical and stuff that you can use. If you have any questions, you can email us at info at martinclinic.com. If you're not a newsletter subscriber, we would encourage you to go to our website, sign up for our newsletters. We talk, a, we give a lot of tips and stuff like that throughout the week, uh, specifically to help you take the information out there and make it very practical so that you can use it. So again, thank you for listening. Have a great day.